we are sitting here on the terrace of Valamar Lacroma Hotel in Dubrovnik, enjoying this beautiful scenery, and the occasion is the first Dubrovnik Half Marathon. You are here to support this event. Yes, uh, the organizer of the race invited me to come and run, but unfortunately I can't run because I'm taking a break after the Boston Marathon. But uh, they insisted that I come in as a promoter, so of course. I would promote any type of running event in Croatia. To sport fans, you are known as a great marathon runner. But tell us something about where you come from, your childhood and education. Um, I was born in Farmington, Connecticut, but I was raised in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, I was born two months early, so the hospital where my parents lived didn't have these uh, all the machines for premature children. That's why I was born in a different town. Um, when I was a child, I didn't do any sports. I wasn't even interested in sports. I did more girly things, tap, ballet, jazz. I played instruments. I was in the art club, in the cooking and sewing club. <laughs> sports weren't on my mind at all. And then when I was in eighth grade, my gym teacher at the time, she wanted me to join the swim team because I was the only girl in my class who knew how to swim. Or I think people knew how to swim, they just didn't want to swim, so they just kind of stayed on the side and said they couldn't swim. Uh, I joined the swim team and quit after the first day <laughs> because uh, I didn't really like swimming. It was really stressful for me because I didn't really understand like the concept of a warm-up and then practice. So the coach told us to go in the pool and swim a couple laps. I don't remember how many. So I just assumed this was a sport. You just had to go as fast as you can. <laughs> so I went as fast as I could, and it was real hard. I never swam before, and when you're swimming fast, you're out of breath, and you raise your head to take a breath, and the water comes. And I couldn't do this anymore, so I quit. Uh, then uh, my gym teacher was always telling me I should do some sort of sport when I'm in high school, and I'm not good with these team sports. I don't have the coordination for balls and things like this. So the only sport that I could do in the fall was cross country. So I just signed up for cross country because I didn't want my gym teacher to bother me anymore. And when I joined the cross country team, that was also hard, but I mean, I quit swimming, so I couldn't quit this. So I told myself I would at least run the first race. And then if I don't do well, then I have an excuse. But I ended up winning my first race, so I stayed with it, and then it, I, in the long run, it sh my gym teacher was right that I was good for these endurance type of sports. You started to run in high school. What was your main discipline? Um, in high school in the U.S., it's different than here. They don't really have clubs. I mean, they have clubs, but they're not really popular. Every school has every single sport available, so you just stay after school and do your training. Uh, so the year is divided up into three seasons, fall, winter, and spring. In the fall, there was cross country, and at that time, cross country for girls was uh, 4K. Uh, then in the winter, there was indoor track, which I ran the one mile and the two mile, and then in outdoor track, the same, the one mile and the two mile. We ran miles, not kilometers, so the one mile is 1,600 meters, the two mile, 3,200 meters. But I like the two mile the best. Ever since I, since I started running, always the longest discipline available to me, I liked. Uh, we didn't have anything longer than two miles. Every school was in a league, so you had races pretty much every single weekend. So in the beginning of the season, it would just be one school against another school. Then at the end of the season would be the championship races. So first you have the league race. And if you ran a qualifying time, you go to the state race. And then if you came in top six, you go to regionals and then nationals. What were your results at those races? Uh, in Connecticut, I always was in the top. I was always running in the top of my state. I won Connecticut state championships one time, but I was always second, third, fourth. Uh, the same thing in the regionals. I was always, most of the time, I was around fourth place. I went to nationals two years in a row, and both times I was 12th place. How come you started running long distance races? Um, well, in college, we had longer races available to us, so I started running the 5K and the 10K and the 3K steeplechase. Um, it wasn't possible in the college system to run a half marathon, so I didn't even think about it. And after I finished college, 
the half marathon just seemed so long. I thought I needed to be older to run it, so it didn't even cross my mind. Um, I started to focus more on longer disciplines because of my current coach, Slavko Petrovic. He told me that I would be good at these. How did you meet Slavko? Uh, actually, I met him on Rogla when I was at training camp. <laughs> I had a different coach at the time, and um, I was talking to Slavic, and I really liked his training philosophy, and I thought I could progress a lot with it. So because of that, I went to him. So you didn't run marathons until you came to Croatia? Yeah, I didn't even... I never ran longer than a 10K in the U.S. So I ran my first half marathon after I came to Croatia and my first marathon. What was the main reason to leave U.S. and come to Croatia? Uh, so when I came to Croatia, I didn't have any type of big plan. A lot of people think that it was real planned, but I just kind of came here. A lot of my friends from college, they went on to work at corporate jobs in some company or in the bank, and they were working long hours. They made a lot of money, but they had no place to spend this money, and I always thought that didn't really make so much sense. So uh, I was just working jobs enough that I could live until I figured out what I wanted to do. And that way of life kind of got expensive in New York City, so I decided to move, and then just came across the idea to come to Croatia. My dad's from Sisak, and his whole family still lives there. And I was never able to speak with them because I never learned Croatian. So I decided to come here and learn Croatian. I didn't think I would be here so long. It's actually kind of funny because uh, after Boston, I was looking through some of my old journals. I always keep a journal. And uh, I came to Croatia in January of 2008. And in around Christmas time of 2007, I wrote a list of things I would like to do. I always write lists of like future goals and plans. And I wrote, go to Croatia, stay there three, maybe five months. <laughs> so, I mean, I just bought a one-way ticket to Croatia. I had enough money in my bank account to buy a one-way ticket back. So I didn't really think this was going to be anything so serious. I was naive and thought I could learn Croatian in three months, which <laughs> didn't happen. So, What was your husband's role in your coming here? I didn't even know Dario before I came here. Didn't no, I met him at a uh, training camp in Rogla at the same time I met Slavic. So uh, I came here with no plans. Your father is born in Croatia, but your mother is Italian-American. You strike me as a quiet person. Well, maybe not in this interview, but usually you do. What happened to your Italian genes? Yeah, I guess. I guess they all went into my legs <laughs> running. <laughs> Italy has a big uh, tradition of distance runners, so maybe I got those genes. Uh, but a lot of my Italian side of the family, they're real loud. It's funny because my Italian grandfather and my dad always used to joke around that if there was a family party from my mom's side of the family, you didn't have to know the address, just the town <laughs> was good enough that you could just stick your ear out the window and hear where it is. <laughs> so, I guess... Maybe everyone was so loud they just drowned me out. <laughs> I know that you read a lot, that you play flute and violin, so you are talented as a musician as well. Considering your formal music education, would you like to be someday active in that field? Um, well, I don't really play the flute and violin anymore. I play them, so I'm completely out of form. Like Playing an instrument is just like running. If you don't practice all the time, then you lose it. I mean, you couldn't get it back once you practice again, but it's different. Uh, I don't really know what I would like to do after I finish running. I would definitely like to do something creative, but what exactly, I don't know. Uh, it's In the U.S., we have a little different mentality than here. Um, here, when you go to college, you have to get a job in that field. But in the, in the U.S., for your bachelor's degree, Everyone says if you're going to get a degree in the humanities, it doesn't really matter what you study, so study what you like, and you can get a job pretty much anywhere, as long as it's not like being a doctor or a lawyer or some specialized field. So when I studied music, I actually started college studying political science because I thought I wanted to be a politician, and then I realized that's maybe not the field for me. <laughs> and then my second year of college, I studied music and film, and I decided after one year, whichever one, I got the higher grades and I would finish to the end. 
and that ended up being music. But, I mean, to get a career in music, most people, a lot of runners nowadays, marathon runners, like, run until their 40s. Like, the girl who won European Championship, she was two months away from turning 40. The girl who won uh, the 10K on the track was 41. So, I mean, it's real hard to start a new career in your 40s. So, kind of not looking forward to <laughs> having to start something from scratch. You live in Croatia since 2008. Since then you managed to build respectable runner's career, being known worldwide. Putting your personal life aside, do you think you would have had a better support as an elite runner in the US rather than here in Croatia? Do they invite you to come back? Uh, I mean, looking at it now, at the level I'm at now, I would have a lot better support than I have here in Croatia. But, I mean, if I stayed in the US, I don't think I would have ever gotten to this level. First of all, uh, after college, I trained myself. I mean, I'm pretty much considering myself a good recreational runner because I didn't have this um, mentality of an elite runner. Training just lasts during the time I was running, but if you want to run at a, at a high level, training has to be 24 hours a day, not just at the time of training. I underestimated the value of a coach. I thought it didn't really matter if you run every day, you'll naturally improve, but it's not like that. You need a coach to make you a plan, to have goals, and I mean, and not just a coach, you need a whole team of people around you. I mean, if you want a professional result, you have to have professional people all around you. Um, and I don't think I would have gotten that in the U.S. just because I didn't realize I needed that. Uh, really, if I didn't meet Slavic, I don't think I would have gotten to this level. He has a big role in my success. I mean, he is really a great coach. It's a shame, like, there's not more people. Like, Croatia small, like, he can't show how much he knows when there's not so many people to choose from. So, I mean... I wouldn't really go back to the U.S. because I don't really think that it's right. I became what I am because of Croatia. On your Facebook page, you wrote that you work as a runner and housewife. What does your typical day look like? Uh, it's, I wrote that I work as a housewife. Uh, it actually started as a joke when I was in college. I've been a housewife on Facebook since 2004. <laughs> uh, my roommate, who, is actually, who was actually my uh, bridesmaid of honor in my wedding, we were roommates in 2004, and i always been into these wife type of jobs. I always like cooking and cleaning and doing this. Like, I have no problem fitting this traditional role. And when I was living with uh, my roommate, Melissa, uh, I always cooked and cleaned for us, just like what I did. And one time, one of my good friends got accepted to a study abroad program in India, and it was pretty competitive, so uh, we invited him over for dinner to celebrate. So I was cooking and cleaning the whole time, and he was sitting watching TV with my roommate. And he told me, oh, come watch TV with us. I was like, I can't watch TV, I'm cooking. And then he was like, w just relax, you don't have to go crazy. And then I was just joking, and I said, oh, I'm in wife training. And then he laughed and said, is your roommate in husband training? Because she was just sitting drinking a beer. <laughs> so I just like kept this on my Facebook. Um, but um, when I'm in training, my day is pretty much just running, eating, sleeping. And that's pretty much it. Like, I wake up, eat breakfast, go to uh, morning training, come home, make lunch, take a nap, have a coffee, go to afternoon training, come home, uh, eat dinner, and then go to bed. So, I mean, there's not really so much free time. Let's get back to running and your last race, Boston Marathon. You ran 2.35.18 and finished 12th. It seemed to me you were not very satisfied with the result. How was the race? We watched the race. At start you were first, you were leading the pack. <laughs> no one wanted to take the lead it's, and I didn't want it to be a slow race, so I just took the lead. I knew it wasn't going to last, but I thought it was better that way. Um, I wasn't really so happy with Boston because I had really good training before Boston. I was in the best shape of my life till up until now. Every single training I did 
so much better than when I ran 225, so I was expecting I had high goals for myself. Um, I had a problem with my leg, and because of that I wasn't able to run how I was trained to run. Um, my IT band uh, uh, cramped up a little bit, so instead of making big steps, I made little steps, and it was really frustrating for me because I knew I could run so much better, and the whole time I could talk like normal because aerobically it wasn't hard for me, just my legs wouldn't cooperate. So because of that, I was a little disappointed. But it's the marathon and these things happen. Uh, the only, I guess, bad thing about running a marathon is at this level you can only run two, maybe three marathons a year, so you have to wait like half a year to show what you can do when you never know what the next training cycle is going to bring. So. But you've already met the criteria for Summer Olympics in Rio next year. What is your goal and expectations? Uh, I, I actually didn't meet the criteria. Uh, no, because um, qualifications in the marathon started the first of this year, but Boston Marathon is too downhill, so it doesn't have a certificate. But since it's a gold label, label race, you can't not qualify, so only the top 10 qualify. So my 12th place finish, re regardless, it didn't matter that I ran a qualifying time, I, didn't, I finished outside the top 10, so it doesn't count as a qualifying time, but uh, it was really important for me to run Boston Marathon, and I knew that it was a risk. The field was really strong, so I'm, it wasn't a given I would come in top 10, but for me, I would rather would have ran Boston and take the risk of not qualifying immediately uh, because every single marathon I've ran, I've always ran an Olympic A standard and now they changed the qualifying procedure so there's not an A standard and a B standard, there's just one standard so it's actually easier to qualify in the marathon now. The A standard for London was 2 hours and 37 minutes and now the standard is 2.42 so uh, I think I should be able to run this no problem at my next marathon. Where do you plan to run your next marathon? Uh, in World Championships in Beijing. So, um, as for Rio, um, I don't really have any expectations currently because I like to take it race by race. But every year the marathon is getting stronger and stronger, so I think it will be a much bigger competition than in London. Elite running is stressful with all the training, schedule, racing and traveling. Where do you see yourself once you wish to stop being professional? What's in the diary of yours for the future? Uh, well, first of all, I don't really think running is so stressful. Like once you get used to the training, if you take care of yourself and recover and rest, uh, you get used to the training so it's not really stressful. Sometimes training, uh, I mean sometimes traveling can be a little stressful because when I go to Poop Parade, they have to bring so many things. Like it, it was so much easier to come to Dubrovnik with just one small suitcase and Poop Parade with a million things. Uh, sometimes, like, it's a little stressful dealing with outside influences other than training, but all in all, if you are careful, it's not really so stressful. Uh, I think it's going to be more stressful trying to find something to do after I finish running. <laughs> uh, I actually don't really have any plan about what I would do. There's a lot of things I would like to do, and the older I get, the bigger that list gets. I mean, I can't even do all the things I would like to do in one lifetime, but definitely I would like to do something related to the arts in some way. But what that would be, I don't really know at the moment. Lisa, thank you for the interview. Thank we you. wish you all the best. Thank you.